Welcome to the first grand rounds of the 2012-2013 season. Uh, I'm at the pleasure of introducing Alex Thompson, uh, who is the program director of the UW Psychosomatic Medicine Fellowship and chief of the Harvard U Medical Center Psychiatric CL Service. He grew up in Denton, Texas, went to undergrad at the University of Texas in Austin, where he got a finance degree. He completed medical school in Houston at Baylor, then did a family medicine psychiatry internship at the University of Iowa. He finished residency at Hopkins, serving as one of the chief residents during his fourth year. He moved to Wayne Caton's NRSA-funded psychiatry primary care research fellowship at UW, where he studied the psychiatric management of common neurologic disorders like epilepsy and Parkinson's. Prior to taking his current role at UW, he was the chief of consultative psychiatry at Group Health, where he led the phone-based psychiatric consult service, provided psychiatric leadership and consult on a project integrating the team care model of, of care into a Group Health primary care clinic, and was the consultant to all of the Group Health behavioral health plan activities. His professional interests are the furthering of care models that help patients receive effective psychiatric care in their medical homes. He is also devoted to developing clinical leaders who are, first and foremost, excellent doctors. He's board certified in adult psychiatry and psychosomatic medicine. Dr. Thompson. Oh, thank you, Sharon. Sharon and I just learned we have a common lineage in Temple, Texas. That's um, well. We're starting a little, starting a little bit late. I apologize. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stand here instead of walk around with the microphone because I'm not used to holding microphones, um, American Idol style. So, I wanted to start this, uh, you know, on the eve of uh, end of the Democratic National Convention, uh, invoking the image of our Senator Franken. And this issue of you know, aren't we good enough? And I want to start off with you know why does somebody like me sitting on a telephone that is providing consultative services to a thousand primary care doctors and hundreds of thousands of patients get called seven times a day? It's uh, really intriguing to me given what we know about psychiatric disorders in primary care. It was also a very interesting experience I had when I was working on the GAU mental health pilot where I had given you know, some 20 doctors my cell phone and said, hey, give me a call. I can help with all these other things. Now, I don't anticipate and don't plan to answer that particular question today, but I wanted to take this chance to kind of from my unique background talk about this MindPhone phone-based consult system that I was involved with at Group Health Cooperative. I'm going to do this by, I want this to tell a story of sorts, uh, first talking about the patient-centered medical home and models of integrating behavioral health care into a medical home, and describe an analysis of the group health mind phone that I'm mentioning here, how it serves a part of group health healthcare system now, and then discuss the role of such services in our current integrated care models and um, even inpatient consult services, because you know, you really integration is everywhere. You, know, you can't, can't swing a Subaru around here without hitting some, some integrated something. And this was unique to me because this is one, uh, this thing I was involved with was the actual only piece of behavioral health that was truly integrated into primary care at group health. So just a little bit about me as we move in here. I like this. This is like Texas Old Testament impact begets GAU, begets MHIP, begets be hip and somewhere in there I was beget right here begotten so during my fellowship as Sharon said I was involved in the GAU mental health pilot so I was one of the well so it's now M hip this was the pilot where the impact model of care was being translated and used to provide uh, outpatient behavioral health care for Pierce and King County residents on the GAU benefit they had lots of problems and no outpatient mental health benefit, and the legislator set, side, set money aside to provide some sort of behavioral health care without a lot of clear direction. And Dr. Veith and Dr. Unitzer were able to step in and help guide and have that 
in an evidence case model, evidence based model. So then prior to moving back to UW, I was chief of consultative psychiatry, which involved running this phone based consult service. I was also the clinical reviewer and the lead for the health plan activities. So I was the insurance goon, really. So when Group Health called somebody and said, this is no longer medically necessary, I was doing that. But one of the most enjoyable parts of my work there was with Elizabeth Lynn taking the uh, team care model of care, which is the same with these collaborative models, and helping um, translate that into the Factoria Medical Clinic there. And uh, the only disclosure I have is I continue to work as a uh, reviewer, an ad, ad hoc uh, reviewer for Group Health Cooperative in the event they have tricky cases. Um, so what I, I first want to talk, because talking about all of this in Group Health without talking about the patient center medical home um, is, could be a bit confusing. And also with the ongoing discussions now about accountable care organizations and uh, what sometimes can be jargon, everybody's talking about the medical home, I actually want to give you a, a, a foundation in that. So these four organizations got together in 2007 and set forth principles for what a primary care medical home would look like. And, you know, the medical home did not start in 2007. This was started decades before as a way of providing better care for pediatric patients. But they set forth seven principles, including having a personal physician. So you're one doctor. It's a true primary care uh, physician model that there is a physician-led medical practice. So it is a whole system of people that is led by that primary care physician, that it's whole person orientation. So it's a system that can provide acute care, chronic care, palliative care, uh, all types of care across all stages of life. The other principles that care is coordinated or integrated across all elements of the system. Quality and safety are the hallmarks. There's enhanced access to care through open scheduling options and what they describe as new mechanisms for communication. This alludes to email communication with doctors. And then payment is appropriate for the new structure. So if we're going to have a medical home where the doctors are emailing with patients a lot, we need to compensate them for that because otherwise it just becomes extra work. So as you can tell, these are not very uh, easy to translate. Well, what is this supposed to look like if you have a primary care clinic and you want to make this into a medical home? How do you do that? Group Health um, had to take and address that in the mid-2000s. And before I go in more detail about their medical home, Group Health is a nonprofit, consumer-governed, integrated health insurance provider and delivery system. That's probably a long way of saying an HMO. Uh, not any longer, but it is, you know, they take the money, they provide the insurance product, they also own the clinics and provide you the care. It's a bit different than that, but because they don't own hospitals anymore, but the one in Capitol Hill, there's 25 primary care clinics, six specialty units, and seven behavioral health clinics. They employ about 10,000 people, uh, about 1,000 doctors, 2,000 nurses, and have operating revenue of over uh, $3 billion dollars a year and it covers about 630,000 people in the Pacific Northwest. So they at a time and I, I neither know about it well enough to speak intelligently there were financial challenges at Group Health in the early 2000s. They were struggling, they were needing to look at different ways of providing care for people. They had I think uh, image problems in the city. Um, I'd heard phrases like group death. That, um, and I think a part of this involved creating and changing the way they were providing primary care for group health uh, clients, patients. Um, and so they tested a medical home model in the Factoria Clinic. And what they did in this medical home was they changed the panel size for the primary care doctors. So they went from having 2,300 patients to 1,800 patients. They increased the amount of time they could spend with the patients. They had epic messaging, so any patient at Group Health can email his doctor and expect some sort of response back. They also set up team meetings. They were going through and starting lean process improvements at the time so that there were huddles daily within the clinic to organize the work and improved outreach and preparation before visits, paying physicians for the time. 
And this is a nice paper in Health Affairs from a couple of years ago where they found this to be tremendously successful to the point that they rolled it out to all of their clinics in January uh, 2010. They found in, in Group Health Research Institute went through and did this analysis that patients reported having better experiences, the physicians described less burnout, there were fewer emergency visits and hospitalizations, and for every dollar they spent, they recouped a dollar fifty. And the money they spent was really to staff up, because if you're going to decrease the panels, you need more doctors, you need more nurses, and they go through in that paper and describe the way they staffed it up and changed. So it's, so they have this medical home at group health. It's very successful. The patients like it. When you look at NCQA standards now for medical homes, there is an ever-increasing emphasis on integrating behavioral health into these medical homes because we know from a lot of research, say done here with UW through group health, that most people's behavioral health problems either aren't identified or if they are identified it's in primary care and then if they are identified in primary care the care as usual isn't very good but this is where people will usually get their care and so these standards really focus on integrating behavioral health into primary care and that in their new standards and NCQA has a mechanism for organizations to be recognized so you can get certified like a JCO certification and one of three conditions proactively identified needs to be a mental health or a CD related condition. So I want to move now then we have this successful medical home at Group Health. We have a drive that the medical home needs to be and have an effective uh, way of integrating behavioral health into it. So I want to talk a little bit about the integration of behavioral health uh, into primary care at Group Health. Kirk Strassel is a clinical psychologist who worked at Group Health for 15 years from 84 through 99. And it's something I've only come to learn now more from talking to a lot of therapists that were at Group Health and talking also to the person who was in my job a bit before me that he propagated his model of primary care behavioral health as it's called at Group Health. So they co-located behavioral health providers and this model, if I were to describe it briefly, is a kind of charismatic, one-off, meet the patient when the patient's distressed, that being defined by the primary care doctor's comfort or trouble with what's happening, doing not a psychiatric or psychological uh, formal evaluation per se and not providing necessarily some specific treatment, but just managing something quite um, briefly. It was something I understand that was liked. The person who I talked to in just communication around the transition of this phone-based system said that one challenge they had is that it was a model that worked very well with Kurt Strassel doing it, but when you take the other therapists and put them in that model, it didn't work as well. When he left, so in the early 2000s, they moved the therapists out of the clinic and back into the seven behavioral health clinics. So by the mid-2000s, having made that move, <coughs> primary care was growing somewhat unhappy about not having any behavioral health kind of presence in their clinics. And what it was and what it looked like when I got there was essentially six or seven carved out behavioral health clinics that for all practical purposes you could look at as functioning almost as an independent behavioral health company. Our behavioral health plan activities were separate from the health plan activities of the greater organization and the clinics and so we had a shared medical record and this mind phone I'll talk about but uh, in general really not integrated at all. So that was a problem. Primary care was grumbling. They weren't happy about what was going on and there was a well-received phone-based consult service at Kaiser Northwest and perhaps as Kaiser goes so does Group Health but uh, this led to in 2006 the mind phone. Um, I did not make up the name. It's catchy. These are marketing materials I had made that uh, my little boy likes to throw. I don't know how well they did at marketing, but you know we take these around and talk to the clinics, and um, it's a brain, as you can see. So this mind phone, it started in 2006. It was not formally a part of the medical home and not included in any way in the evaluation of the medical home. And there's nothing 
fancy about this. This is on-call psychiatry during business hours, but it's a hotline. So unlike our console service at Harborview, it's a hotline. There's not an ex expectation somebody's going to see the patient. They're calling with a specific question. There's a phone number, a staff message, uh, and a pool within a staff message pool within Epic. And so how it works, there's a toll-free number, there's an internal number, and an Epic uh, staff message route to pose questions. And the original intention was to have the phone answered immediately or within 30 minutes. And then after the consultation, me as the consultant writes a note, puts it in the chart, it certainly goes to the primary care doctor. Um, I made some changes so that it was actually on a, a call center so that we could start tracking volume and looking at things because before it was just one number that could be routed to different doctor's cell phones. And the way it was staffed was seven different doctors, each with variable activities during the day. So some folks would have clinic time and you could see how this would set up so that there's going to be a different experience for the primary care doctor depending on the person who's assigned that day and what he has going on. So. By the time or when, when I got there, there had not been any routine measures of call volume, the lengths of these calls, the reasons for the calls, the outcomes of the calls, any of the things that you would expect in organizations if you're going to start and spend money on something to say, well, why are we doing this? Are we getting any value from it? That was actually ongoing when I got there, and that's what, and part of what I'm presenting is talking about an analysis of this service. There was a partnership for innovation project that Brad Steinfeld, who's the director of their psychology services there, uh, applied for from the Group Health Foundation. The purpose of this was, I think, it, it just what I described. It was to test the effectiveness of the availability and to use an analysis to try to look at the potential for expanding it that you know, there was some question around whether or not people really still had in this large organization a sense that this service was available, what it did, and what it could do, and if there was any way to actually expand it out because there was a sense that there really are not a lot of phone calls to this, though it seems like it could be potentially helpful. The evaluation of the um, grant was led by Paul Fishman. He's a cost, he's an economist, cost expert through the Group Health Research Institute. He's been really great in helping uh, connect me with this information. And what his evaluation involved was general usage data, a PCP satisfaction survey, and then a cost analysis. And I'm going to, kind of depending on the time, I'll go through that. It's, it's cost data is quite complex. It's easy to argue that some of it is uh, not accurate, but he was and, and provided what I thought was some provocative information. So the limitations just in starting to do this evaluation, so we've got this phone-based service, it's been going on for six years, there's not been any really formal mechanism for evaluating it, and the challenge is that Paul and that we continued to find was that there is no dedicated way to link the phone consult to the primary care encounter that generated it. So you just don't have that. There are no standards for diagnosing conditions or putting in diagnoses in the MindPhone note or in the PCP note. The detailed information about the consults are in text boxes, so you can't extract that but for some Herculean effort. And then the encounter type used to put our note in in the same way we have encounter types in ORCA, is a mental health virtual consult that had been used by other behavioral health providers for a whole slew of reasons. So there were lots of um, uh, non-specifics here. And then there was a mind phone chief complaint. So we did have one unique thing that could identify what was one of these consults. However, there was no way to pull data based on the chief complaint. Like, okay, so you're hosed a little bit. What they, so what he did, it's pretty interesting, he identified, so went through these 20 months and identified every epic encounter that had a mental health virtual consult and then looked, because one thing is there were only seven doctors who would do these consults and so took all of the mental health virtual encounters and sort of cross-referenced it to the doctors who would be doing the MindPhone services and then linked each one of those 
to a face-to-face -face encounter that happened either the day of, the day before, or the day after. And the day before and day after was because frequently we would get um, prophylactic calls, like I got this person coming, I'm looking at my schedule tomorrow and you know, holy whatever. Um, or it was late in the day and this happened and can you help me with this and it made sense. So this is, I'm gonna go through first the usage results in the survey that he did and then the cost analysis. So for the 20 months, there were uh, about 2,700 virtual encounters by one of the uh, mind phone psychiatrists. So depending on how you do the math, that's about seven calls a day. And when you look at some of the other usage data I'll show you, and then what I did, bec I, I actually turned this service into a, a call center. So there was one number that routed, and these call centers, you can track you know, the, the people that run or that work in call centers, they can track everything. And it's valuable to have if you're running a phone-based service because you can see how quickly it takes somebody to answer the phone, how long the phone call is, uh, where if something goes to voicemail. Um, they didn't have that then. And they found 982 face-to-face -face encounters with primary care providers the day of. And so these were the cases. This is what they looked at, these 982 encounters and the consult that went with it. So these are the diagnoses that drove these calls. And you'll notice there, the, the numbers do not add up to 982, and that's because in a great deal of the primary care visits, there's no behavioral <laughs> health diagnosis listed. We did not routinely put any type of diagnosis in these consult notes, because we really weren't trying to make a diagnosis. We were providing answers to a specific question. But what you see is, and I think this makes common sense, about two-thirds of these calls were related to anxiety and depressive disorders, and then about 20% were related to substance use disorders. And this was, I was surprised that the cognitive disorders were 18 because at some point a tremendous number of our calls were for, you know, grandma's gonna lose her placement because of what's happening at the adult family home and the family's called me uh, in extremis and now can you help me with this? And we say Seroquel. Um, no, not really. That's not evidence-based. I'm sorry. We would never do that. Um, so the, uh, but a tremendous amount of substance-related problems because they're just, uh, uh, well, a lot of substance problems. So this is where I think this is very interesting. So this was through that 20 months. This is per primary care provider, the actual number of calls. So when they went through those 982 or how many? And what you see is a whole bunch of kind of you know average usage by a number of people, and then explosive usage by a few people. This is sort of the you know interesting healthcare cost thing. Like 20% of the people spend 80% of the money, and that's really the case here. Probably 20% or 14% of the uh, primary care doctors generated a substantial amount of them. Um, and this is, I didn't black out the clinics. These are all of the clinics, and down here, this is their Northgate Clinic, and this is the frequency of calls, and this is the Olympia Clinic, and this is the Family Health Clinic. And these are certainly some of their biggest clinics, so you would expect that. But when you start looking at, and then when we went and I went and met with these clinics, there's something that is not simply the volume of the clinic. Uh, that happens uh, or, or that drives this because in some of the lower clinics, and I'll talk about this a little bit, I met the chief of the clinic who for whatever reason had a bad experience and told somebody, it's like, that's service, that's worthless. You know, and so when the chief of a clinic says that, in general, they're less likely to use it. And Northgate, um, those folks there absolutely loved it. This was the frequency by day of consultation this was just to look to see if there was any specific pattern. Um, there really wasn't. There is a bit of a spike at the beginning and the end of the month, whether or not that relates to some sort of care seeking in primary care by people with behavioral health problems is, is not clear. There's no kind of cause. Uh, the one thing I think is interesting is when you look over this whole 20-month um, period, the largest number of calls on a single day was eight. And it's just, 
you know, they cover 630,000 people, and it's a phone number that everybody knows about. Everybody that comes in gets uh, a lot of information about this. It's on the website. It's so it's just interesting. So the PCP survey, they uh, found all the primary care providers who were involved in the face-to-face -face encounters, and Dr. Fishman they sent them a survey. The survey said, "Have you used it? Have you? Uh, how many times have you used it in the past year?" How fast did they answer? Uh, why did you call? And then an open comment period. They got 53 responses. 10% um, of people said they actually hadn't used it. So that may speak to just challenges in this methodology where you're trying to connect face-to-face -face encounters with consults, but you may not actually be connecting the two. And uh, about 94% of the people that responded did describe using it more than once. They, uh, most of the calls were for medication management. Uh, a smaller number were for suicidal ideation. That was my experience. A great deal of it was this person has come in, they're having these kinds of you know, challenges. What would be the next thing that I would do? Or you know, do you think this person needs to go to specialty behavioral health? Um, but there was also a lot, and we were often very helpful when somebody would be suicidal. Like, you know, these folks have super busy clinics, and when you have somebody walk in and now you've just turned your primary care clinic into a PEZ, and you don't know how, you know, the complex behavioral health, you call the liaison nurse at the behavioral health access unit who gets the information and then goes through, you know, authorization and finds hospitals. It's, it's a system that's hard to navigate, and so we could be helpful doing that. Um, about three quarters of the time, they described responding uh, immediately or within a half hour. I think on one hand you could look at that positively. On the other hand, um, you know, one out of every four calls, somebody's either not getting a response or it may take them more than a half hour. And you'll see in some of the comments uh, where that bears out. And most people knew that they provided chemical dependency services, but a whole lot didn't. They just thought it was a, they didn't actually know how to go about getting any information on those services. Most people describe being very satisfied with the service. 15% describe being satisfied. A small portion said they were not satisfied. The, I have a number, because there were a lot of open comments. There, there were a few things I thought were interesting and uh, from a uh, you know, qualitative research standpoint. There were lots and lots of positive comments and a whole, a whole lot of them were more like, please keep the service, don't stop the service. I mean, this wasn't a question like, do you think we should continue the service? We're planning on stopping it. Yeah, I think it's, it's something telling about how people kind of speaks to perhaps the culture of this organization and other organizations when there is an evaluation that's going out about some service and the natural response is, wow, this must be on the chopping block. That's, um, and I think people in an organization where they watch things come and go quickly, it's, so I was, it was just something to see that that was really the, um, uh, you know, there were some, I think this kind of models, it's been a great program. They described people not answering the phone as quickly. This was, I think, also an important comment where somebody said, this is wonderful. It helps me feel more comfortable getting somebody started on a medicine until I can get them into a psychiatrist. And when we are talking about the challenges in our integrated care programs, trying to provide good behavioral health care in primary care clinics, this is a cognitive block because there are a lot of folks who say, hey, this is neat um, to do this. Now, when are they going to be able to go see the psychiatrist? Because I'm, I'm happy to get the advice on how to start this, but I don't have any sense or interest in following up on it. Um, and then this was, you know, somebody was just like, it's awesome. I love getting a response back in a day. So it, it was interesting to me. There was a lot of either misunderstanding about uh, what the service was supposed to do. I think this is important. There were, and the negative feedback I would hear, particularly from the chief, was, you know, these guys aren't worth a crap. When I call and I want an appointment for somebody tomorrow, they can't do it. I was like, you know, and I, I don't know how it got, and it was never advertised as, the access line for behavioral health services at group health, but I think that is seen a lot, and it's something that we have to, you know, that we're challenged with when we're moving into primary care clinics and trying to look at changing models of care. 
And then the other comments were just, I have a patient right here. I've got, you know, a busy clinic and, you know, these are folks that are challenged with productivity numbers and patient surveys as we all are hearing about. And so it's very hard for them to struggle and deal with this. And if they want to have a question answered in real time, uh, I'm going to have it done quickly. So, yeah, we're doing all right. So the, the last part of this was the usage data was a cost analysis. And so this is the same. There's nothing, this is the same. He identified these cases and then identified a comparator group. This really wasn't a formal control group and not a case control study. It was a comparator group for the purpose of looking at cost trends, not trying to look at, because um, I'm not an expert in cost analyses and cost data, but you know it's not cut and dry. You can't say this was statistically significantly higher and we know that. It's, you know, they're getting it from a system that is bundling lots of different costs. What he did was um, reserve a set of face-to-face -face visits during the same time as these other ones that did not have a virtual consult but did have a behavioral health diagnosis. And then take a 10% random sample within uh, each of those categories. So find a whole bunch of visits that you know, the, the, the fantasy would be we got 982 face-to-face -face encounters here that were associated with a virtual consult. And here's another 982 primary care encounters that had some psychiatric diagnosis associated with it, but there was no virtual consult. And we want to look at the cost trends of these two groups and see if there's any difference to say, well, is there something different about the people that the primary care doctor is calling a psychiatrist for versus those who they're not? And so looked at 66,000 primary care encounters that took place during the same time and didn't have a mental health virtual consult. And among that group, there were uh, 45,000 that included a behavioral health diagnosis in one of the 10 categories that had been used. Um, and then just identifying healthcare costs and key components of care for the year before and the year after the MindPhone consult. So this, and really, so time zero is the time of the consult. And these are going in months before. And this is aggregate. So this is all of the patients, and it's an average cost. It's not a, you know, an individual person's <laughs> cost. And what is seen or what is suggested, and it is a heroic assumption, and I want to be very clear that I'm not in any way suggesting there was some magical uh, reversing or arresting of costs because of the uh, you know way I talked on the phone to the primary care doctor. It's just more in looking at a service like this and how do you try to determine what value these are important things to begin to look at. Mm -hmm. But for the cases, it appears for the index time that there is some increase in health care costs. Now, this whole thing is an artifact. When you're looking at costs at a time where somebody's coming in for services, you're going to always see an increase in costs. So it's not, it's, it's, there's nothing um, unique there. So when you go and see people when they're beginning to use services, you're going to see that the costs are rising. But the issue is that there appears to be a spike for those for whom the call was made to the console service, which is the suggestion there. And then this breaks down the cost in other specialty care, ER care, pharmacy care, and primary care. And that for those with um, the point here, and I'm not going to go through each of these pieces, is in the ER care and specialty care, there appeared to be a spike or an increase in the costs compared to those who didn't have a consult. And this is for those without a virtual consult, and they're not, if you overlap them, it's impossible to look at. But this was the one, so this is looking at inpatient costs over time for these two groups, and that for the folks that there was a consult made, it's just the same trend that Dr. Fishman was seeing, where there appears to be, before the call, some increase in 
service usage. And so the sense was, what's that? Yeah. It's an interesting scale. I, I'm just trying to imagine the, the difference in inpatient cost between a couple hundred dollars and six hundred dollars. I mean, it seems like one day of hospitalization. Already. I guess it's just an average. Yeah, it's an average across like about a thousand people. Yeah. So, so there'd be a lot of the cost there would need to be. Yeah. Okay. And I really wanted to not not minimize this data. I think it's right. it's interesting. Yeah. It's exploratory yeah. in in a way of trying to group a comparator group and another group where we didn't and the system was never set up to do a very good um, way. But um, certainly, you know, Dr. Fishman who does this kind of stuff for you know decades said you know this is an interesting cost trend when you see this while you don't make any sort of assumption that the consult did it there seems to be some trend with this assumption that perhaps had the consult or other things not happened that this would continue up as opposed to returning back to the level you would see with somebody that might be a similar so that there's not and what exactly is happening here is not clear it just suggests that there may be something in that um. Alex, yes. Were you able to track people calls that were made but not answered? Like you know, complaints that they made the calls weren't answered. Right? So that's uh, and that. So what the question was is, it, were we able to track calls that were made but not answered? And, and no, actually, there was no way to track um, any any of the calls and to actually see. So one thing that was interesting I did, because a lot of my work, I was down in, in Tukwila in this wonderful cubicleville that had been a converted um, check processing place. This is at the, the, major, the main administrative offices for group health. And that's where the, because if you're getting behavioral health services, you call a 1-800 number. It's that number when everybody says, call your insurance company. And you get in, and there's this massive um, phone system behind that. And so people that work on... Um, those kinds of phone services, there is a big motherboard that shows who's online to take a call, how quickly the call is answered, how long that call goes on. And so I was really intrigued by that, and uh, the woman who managed that helped me set that up for our service. So each of the mind phone doctors, we actually turned our desk phone into a, a phone on this system. And so once you did that, it was set up on this Avaya system so you could then pull monthly reports and see how many calls came in, when were they answered, how many went to voicemail. Um, so because there was no way to track that. And we also ended up changing the and, and getting an encounter type created so you would actually have a unique encounter so you could pull them. Um, uh, I think the uh, providers like this kind of service. A lot of them describe being satisfied or very satisfied. I think with this, uh, and I had a conversation recently with the man who was involved in putting this together, and the customer service and expectation management is huge. If you're going to set up something to try to serve primary care, uh, and you've got a lot of busy folks, you're going to have to operate on their schedule. You're going to have to find some way. But the challenge that they had run into was if you take a physician and have him offline all day and he ends up answering eight phone calls when during that day could be seeing patients it, it, it doesn't make any financial sense but then you look and like well how would we go about increasing the number of calls because we do know that or have at least a hint that there is some benefit to having somebody providing that kind of follow providing that kind of feedback to primary care doctors around how they're caring for their behavioral health patients there's some suggestion that for those who had a consult um, that perhaps they had more acute needs that led to this spike in costs earlier. Uh, this doesn't in any way attribute the change in the cost or this arresting of the cost curve to the consultation. It just describes the trend, but it's just this suggestion in looking at this. So we have a service that people really like. We also have a service where there may be some hint and would require further study that there is actually some cost benefit to doing this for primary care patients. The use is extremely variable. That's what I was struck by. In an organization that also has a lot of connectivity and communication, and despite going around, 
kind of whistle stop tours that I would do going to see all the primary care clinics and meeting people and talking about this and handing out squishy brains and whatnot that still, you know, and there's a lot of, you know, these are really busy folks. Maybe they just don't have time to call. Maybe they don't find that it's really valuable. Maybe they think they know what they're doing because, you know, the, the story going back to the person who was at the peak of that, you know, that, that was somebody who also, I understand, did that with lots of other services. So it had more, it, it was more of a factor of the person and concerns or anxieties about taking care of, taking care of patients as opposed to that, that person just has <coughs> essentially a, you know, really robust load of very sick people and they just need more help. I think one thing that is interesting and we were not, and it has not been uh, studied with this service is, you know, there is a sense from the people doing that that this kind of service can decrease specialty referrals. Um, when I think about, and I bring up this question about, you know, is there any role for this kind of more formal phone-based service in a hospital setting? when we're talking about the efficient use of resources and that perhaps a third of our phone calls with a good chart review and a clear recommendation could solve the problem. It could be an effective consult. Um, it's, there's some literature in looking at uh, pediatric and there was a study in Britain where they actually looked and set up a study if we instead of just allowing for the reflex referral of patients to specialty care, set up a telephone consultation that uh, it actually decreased referrals to and it improved patient satisfaction because they were involved in the process of the primary care doctor and the specialist communicating around it. So I am winding down here just in thinking about integrating behavioral health into primary care. There's a number of different ways of looking at this. You can co-locate some type of behavioral health provider in a primary care clinic. I think we've seen this a lot. I think there's ongoing discussions when people are talking about we have an integrated care system and what they have is they have somebody with some behavioral health experience nearby. So it's, it's a, an emotional, it's a salve of sorts. It has nothing to do with a more efficient use of resources. It has to do with having somebody there. I believe that's the model that was being used in the past. There can be shared decision making and a co-location of primary care and behavioral health providers. I think group health has that now. And we have this phone-based consult service so a primary care doctor can call a psychiatrist 24 hours a day because there's somebody on call at night. Um, and in a number of the clinics, the behavioral health clinic is actually, so you go to Factoria, the behavioral health clinic is upstairs, but they're upstairs. I mean, they might as, it, you know, it's, Palestine and Israel, that are two different places. There's no, there's no sort of true integration around the services. It just happens to be a, a more of a building resource issue. There is you know, now talk and work about specialty medical homes in community mental health centers for the seriously mentally ill. And then when we move towards the evidence-based models that we're working with here, where you have team-based interventions, where you use systematic screening, you have skilled case managers or care managers providing um, support to primary care and evidence-based psychotherapy and registries to follow that. So just winding down, could or should, because one thing I'm, I'm interested in with the BHIP programs and MHIP programs and GAU programs, is there some role or could there be some role for a more formal phone-based consult service to support the primary care doctors and what they're doing for almost all of their patients because we don't necessarily see everybody in the whole clinic. We have systems where we are seeing a population well, but not everybody. And the, these are these are ways, they're, they're ways they certainly make the primary care doctors uh, happy. It improves our relationships with them and can actually help in the kind of ongoing education of them and how they care for everybody. And then this is the you know thought and some of this has been talking to you know Dr. Zatzik here and when we look at well what what do we really do in the hospital I mean we're in a model now where you know Dr. Dubofsky's got our pager 
She gets a call. We go and see that person. We're not in any kind of systematic way looking and caring for the population of people with delirium or depression or PTSD within the hospital. It's still in a model of a one-off. Just if they need it, we do it. Uh, but I think there's a slow move now towards, like, Dr. Dunn's work, where we go and screen everybody who came in with an alcohol-related trauma, and we go and see them. And that I could, I could see or envision at some point where we have more systematic screening, where we're not waiting to get calls. We're trying to see the whole population of patients in the hospital and also have a phone-based service of some sort where there's the expectation that we're going to review and answer the questions and if it's really medically needed we could go and see the patient but in a lot of cases we're able to help otherwise and do other things so questions I got I gotta switch here I need to pop over to the web questions Does anybody have any questions about I tried to roll through that and I rolled through it pretty quick because I was worried about the time Yes. It's very interesting to learn what. Are they, are they still doing this? If you're talking, this my, this phone system? Models. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. This was going, and this was the first analysis that just got done. The um, there are very striking differences, you know, between this model and the impact integrated care model that we're deploying. Globally. Yeah. A, a critical feature of the difference is the fact that what clearly shows evidence would be effective and. And the model, the impact model, is the accountability, the tracking of measurement-based care, and the reminder to come back and revisit the patient if they're not getting better. And none of those are possible in this model. This looks like a, a high-end, maybe one-time consultation. It might be sort of a very highly resourced triage, and maybe facilitating getting to clinic. You didn't say whether they actually got to clinic. And, and so many of the features that we know increase the effectiveness, increase the utilization, increase the satisfaction embedded in the integrated care program that we're right. accustomed to aren't possible. This is more like a, a MedCon sort of thing than yeah. a whammy. And maybe the very best you could do is answer a specific question I would imagine. And or facilitate getting someone into the hospital or someone into the clinic. Yeah. So my view of your, of your question is that this is a very restricted resource in some ways. It might be nice to have a point for, well, we have residents for that, right? So, right, yeah. Um, so. So, um, so it's interesting to me that, that uh, that's essentially what they're using. It has such a limitation. Well, and that was a question I had in doing it. Just, well, why? Yeah. You know, they, it costs money to have people. One of the, there is a, uh, a question that came through on the webcast. Did the psychiatrist answering the phone have protected time and they're scheduled to answer the calls? If they did have protected time, was it taken into account with regards to cost data? Um, this cost data doesn't have anything to do with the. It, it, they're not. It, it was not taken into account. They're not related. The um, psychiatrist answering the phone did have some protected time, but a number of them. So it was made up of me and then the chiefs of the different behavioral health clinics, and typically would they would see anywhere from two to four hours of patients a day. Uh, not new evals, but 30-minute follow-ups. So you can see the challenge if you just sit down with somebody or and then there's a phone call, it may be a long time before you get back to them. I was mostly doing other types of administrative uh, work. But, you know, I, I had wondered with the integrated care models, do, do you find, Richard, that the clinics also avail themselves of calling the consulting psychiatrist outside of the integrated work? Well, Just yes, the, Jim, does any, is Jim? Jim here, some of the people who are doing it, they certainly have access to right. their pagers and they're encouraged to call. I suspect that there's always there's some variability in utilization of that. But yeah. Yeah. So that's one piece of the. But yeah, the and. Any other questions? Yes, Whitney, yeah. The uh, uh, graph, and you talked a little bit about that, I'll let her call all the time, maybe being maybe just a more anxious person. But I was just wondering if there was also any trend towards training, like if some of the people that called more were people with uh, maybe nurse practitioners or PAs who I think don't get a, you know, even less behavioral health training maybe than doctors do in medical school. I just was curious about No, that. That, is a great, that is a great question. 
got a lot of calls from because they use nurse practitioners on their um, home care service who would go and see folks uh, with dementia and they would often call. Uh, Brad Steinfeld and I went around to a number of the high using clinics to talk to um, just just to talk and kind of understand and it, it was interesting it seemed that a number of the people that ended up using the service a lot actually felt extremely comfortable with managing substance use and behavioral health problems sometimes it was almost calling to check in on things or they they were more aware of it you know I came to understand that there would be physicians within the clinics who because they would you know could tolerate somebody with you know God forbid some type of uh, mental health aberration like tear tears um, and that that person would get a lot of the depressed patients and then they would end up being somebody who would call the service more so I left with some bit of sense that in fact it was you know the the choir calling the preacher like there was a whole bunch of folks and there was a whole lot of stuff that there were a lot of people who didn't for whatever reason either have any interest in identifying or addressing these issues or just had a general sense that they knew what they were doing and weren't going to call. So it's very interesting, but I don't know, thank you.